As we continue in this peaceful mood, let me share with you the news of our congregation. We will rejoice with Susie Davis, who is recovering from surgery. And our hearts go out to Nancy Carrillo, whose brother died last week in a motorcycle accident. We honor Steve and Rodine Phillips, who celebrated their 50th anniversary yesterday. And we celebrate with three of our former interns, Carmen, Andrew, and Antonia, who were all welcomed into preliminary ministerial fellowship by the UUA in a ceremony called the Service of the Living Tradition at the General Assembly, which was held in Minneapolis last week. Let us open our hearts to all who celebrate love in this season of commitment. And all who have triumphs like graduations to share. We pray for ease for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We wish all those who did the business of the UUA last week at the General Assembly safe and comfortable travels as they return home today and tomorrow. We pray for ourselves, for peace in all that troubles us, and we pray that we might see the shimmer of beauty and spirit in each of these summer days, appreciating the love around us and the light within. Peace be with you all. When the state of Arizona passed a clearly unconstitutional law mandating the police to check the immigration status of everyone they were doing business with and who seemed to them, that's a pretty slippery word, seemed, likely to be an undocumented alien, I thought it was time that I learned a little more about this difficult subject. And the best way for me to make sure that I learn something about a new subject is to schedule myself to write a sermon on the topic. <laughs> and that's what I did. Who boy. Turns out that immigration is not a topic. Immigration is a life study. And it's a life study in a field in which it seems nobody is neutral and in which people are so passionate that they are very sloppy with the truth. It's a topic which requires thinkers to project into the future and pretend they're sure of themselves. It's a topic which reaches deeply into people's inner world, into their need to be comfortable in society, secure in their job, feel that life is reasonably fair. It's a subject that trades in soul-deep fears about change, and fear of other. It's a subject that calls Americans back to the American dream and asks how far we should extend the American experiment. George H. Bush tried at the top of his power to get immigration reform and failed. President Obama was going to tackle it, but the recession got in the way. He wisely decided to postpone, but his hand is being forced. And unfortunately, democracy, especially polarized democracy, does not lend itself to decisions in which the facts, the numbers, and the assumptions are soft and everybody's ox is going to be gored. Immigration reform is a lot like climate change. It's going to tax our powers of understanding and cooperation to the max. And just as the folks who worried about climate change have latched on to climate chaos as a term to describe what's going on right now, so I'm going to call the Im curtain, current immigration situation in the US immigration chaos. Vocabulary is important. What we have now is chaos. Since none of us like chaos, calling it that will help us get motivated to change it. And while we're on vocabulary, let's name the major players in immigration chaos correctly. It is morally abhorrent to call people illegals. <laughs> it's similar to calling people suffering from leukemia cancers. It's dehumanizing. 
And using dehumanizing vocabulary diminishes, diminishes its victims, and that's immoral, and allows the name callers to proceed as if human beings were not involved, which perpetuates immorality. A person is a person. Their status may be undocumented, and they may have broken the law, but they are people. So how do you eat an elephant? One step at a time. <laughs> After a couple of weeks of diving into literature and getting more and more confused, I realized that part of my confusion was that this subject has three major aspects, and most discussions conflate them. While the three aspects have to be dealt with at the same time, they have to be separated in order to be understood and solved. The three aspects are, do we want any immigration to be legal? And what purposes would that serve? And how do we do that fairly? Secondly, do we want to prevent illegal immigration? And if so, what's the best way to do that? And thirdly, what do we do about the estimated 12 million undocumented residents of our nation? My perspective is the perspective of a minister, of a person especially commissioned by you and by society, by extension, to think about the meanings of things and their spiritual or depth aspects. I'm no expert on immigration. Boy, did that become clear. I'm only an expert on values. So here we go. Bite number one. Why have legal immigration in a nation? And what are its costs? Well, first of all, let's think about this historically. A nation needs immigration when there is a lot of land or when the land has been depopulated. This was the case in the US up to recently. While we should always remember that there were people here before America was here from whom the land was clearly stolen, that's another topic. The need for people to populate the land and own it and develop it according to Western values drove in this nation a very open immigration policy during most of our history. Immigration has made this nation what it is today. You can make a strong case that this nation is no longer in need of more people to develop it and keep it safe. Secondly, you need immigration because you need people to do the work that the native population won't or can't do for the wages that produce goods that people will pay for. Big, long, complicated equation. You need immigration when a nation is not producing enough entry-level workers because of population trends, which is where we are today. You need immigration when the native population disdains or is not fit for important work, such as farm work or high-tech work. Now, a part of that imbalance between what the native population disdains or is, does not fit itself for is caused by the fact that we don't want to pay enough for some kinds of work. There's an ugly word for taking advantage of someone's weak status to make money at their expense. That word is exploitation. And it's morally dicey, unless you're giving something in return. In our current system, the return for picking lettuce for peace rates until your back breaks is that your kids get a free education and hopes that they won't have to sweat in the sun in their lifetime. But if that's the scene, you're always going to need immigrant workers from destitute nations, because the economy will never then tolerate good enough wages working conditions and benefits to attack the natives or even the children of your last generation of immigrants to work. This can't go on forever. We either have to begin to change the economics of food production and yard work and construction to be stable, or we have to exploit what are called guest workers, a horrible misnomer, speaking of vocabulary, because contrary how I'm sure you treat your guests, Guest workers are only invited when you need them, and they're thrown out when you don't, and have no incentive other than their destitution and no love for the nation in which they work, a morally repugnant scheme. A third reason to have immigration is that a nation understands itself as a nation of immigrants. 
full of people who have a sense of gratitude that their own immigrant ancestors or parents or they themselves came to this nation and want others to have that chance. All by itself, America for Americans is morally suspect and spiritually bankrupt. A version of, now that I have it, nobody else can come. There are good reasons to limit immigration, but we can never forget who we are, and we should probably always have some immigration because that is who we are. And finally, you allow immigration on humanitarian grounds. You want to rescue people who've been persecuted or who have lost their homes. This is currently a very small portion of immigration, but global warming and sea rise is going to make it big. We might as well get prepared. And why, on the other hand, is immigration periodically resisted, often fervently, in a nation? Some of that, of course, is racism, xenophobia, selfishness, and other pathologies. But there are good and rational reasons that people worry about uncontrolled immigration. First of all, they want a stable population. Runaway population growth is a problem for ecology, and it's a problem for human services. Too much protesting along these lines starts sounding like selfishness, but some is certainly warranted. Secondly, people resist uncontrolled immigration because they believe that national strength is a product of national cohesion and that that depends on shared culture and shared language. And they're not wrong about that. There is an American way, for better or for worse, as someone who worked for three years with a person who loved the Canadian way and not the American way, I can tell you how pervasive the American way seems to non-Americans. But overall, I like it, and I want to keep it. Thirdly, people resist immigration because it undermines the wages of the least skilled and trained Native workers. If my kid had dropped out of high school, I would really care about this. Immigration is an overall boon for the economy, but there's no question about it. It depresses the lowest wages of the native-born workers. Given these reasons for and against immigration as a whole, what might we say about crafting a sensible, legal immigration policy? Here are some of my thoughts, by no means comprehensive, but offered to you after one week of study. First of all, it seems to me that the, a new immigration law needs to slow down the pace of immigration for the moment, to let our self-image as a proud and diverse nation of immigrants reassert itself over the fears and stresses of what has been, in the last 20 years, a very fast pace of change. To ignore the popular feeling about this is to make a space for demagoguery and law-breaking. We are seeing this already, and it's not worth it. Secondly, since we want to and need to control our population, we should limit the number of family members an immigrant can bring with them to this country to their legal partners and their minor children. Everybody else applies on their own. And thirdly, the politicians should hammer out the philosophy of what kinds of industry needs the support of immigrant workers and leave the actual number crunching each year to be worked out administratively. Currently, it's Congress members with no more knowledge than you or I of the subject who set the number of legal immigrants that are allowed each year, and they set the numbers at irrationally low levels. Politicians don't feel they can afford to do anything else. But because these levels are woefully insufficient, there becomes the market for illegal workers. One major goal of immigration reform should be, in my opinion, to end illegal immigration. But there is no fence tall enough and no, no man's land wide enough to keep out people who want to work if that fence has a sign on it that says, help wanted. So that brings us to bite number two, illegal immigration. So swallow hard. And here we go. 
You might think that it goes without saying that we want to end illegal immigration, but I'm sorry to say there are huge and powerful interests which like things just the way they are. These are the employers of illegal workers. The employment of illegal workers is extremely lucrative. These workers will work for under market wages. They don't complain about ill treatment. They know there's no way to get the law to enforce work safety and health rules. The employment of illegal workers gives an employer a huge advantage over their lawful competitors. I would point out that the consumer also benefits from these unfair and often immoral employment practices. Ponder that as you enjoy your tomato sandwich this afternoon. I know you don't choose to be exploitive of other human beings, but until the tomatoes in your own garden ripen, you just might be. Another way you benefit from illegal immigration, we, I should say we, benefit, is that many uh, illegal immigrants and their employers do pay employment taxes using false social security numbers. That amounts to so much money every year that will never have to be paid out in benefits that it is a line item in the social security budget. Illegal immigration is one of the reasons that social security is still solvent. Because there are lots of benefits to illegal immigration, it has been allowed to flourish, but there is currently being a strong reaction to this. Most proposals uh, to stop illegal immigration involve a secure border. We New Mexicans are not so easily fooled as the rest of the country by that idea because we know what a desert looks like. But many Americans believe that this is an attainable goal. So let's talk about borders. There are three reasons for a nation to secure its borders. The first is that so people can't flood your markets with undesirable or untaxed goods. And our current border security was built 100% to solve that problem. Therefore, border security involves the expecting of roads leading into American markets. Even this goal is difficult when the undesirable goods in question are drugs, which are very compact and hard to find, and when people can fly airplanes and bypass the roads. <clears throat> A second reason to keep people out of your nation is to keep them out if they mean you harm. Many kinds of people, spies, terrorists, escaping criminals, drug runners, how much of that you can realistically do keep out people who mean you harm is a question I can't answer. But it is clear, at least, that terrorists and spies favor eastern airports to southwestern deserts as their national entry of choice. The final reason to secure borders is to prevent undocumented workers from messing with your economy and allowing themselves to be exploited. But you don't need an expensive and indefensible fence to accomplish this goal. You only need two things. They are very simple, but powerful forces oppose them. First of all, you need a right to work card, which lives in the 21st century and whose security system is more sophisticated than blue curlicues. It's issued to everybody, citizen and immigrant alike, who has the right to work in this nation. It goes to everybody because it is not the case that you know them when you see them and this is America, and we believe in equality under the law. Secondly, you enforce the law, which already exists, which requires employers to assure themselves that their employees have the right to work. And now that you've made it possible for them to actually determine this by that right to work card that is hard to forge, you add mandatory penalties on the employer if the person responsible for hiring pays a hefty fine and spends 30 days in jail every time they're caught with an undocumented worker, and after, say, two slips in a company, the CEO finds himself in jail for 30 days too, illegal workers would find it very hard to get jobs. And if immigration officials quit patrolling the deserts of the Southwest and began the much more congenial work of randomly checking on employers, Nobody would come to this country illegally looking for work anymore. Take down the sign on the fence that says, 
help wanted apply within, you don't need the fence anymore. This simple solution is not possible at the moment because American citizens are scared of anything that resembles a national identity card, liberals and conservatives alike. But the only way I can think of for a rich nation which cares about civil rights to solve the illegal immigration problem is to make it impossible for illegal immigrants to work. And in a nation where you can't tell them by looking at them, that has to involve a right to work card that lives in the 21st century and doesn't involve blue curly cues. There will have to be a lot of work done to help both liberals and conservatives feel safe about the introduction of such a card. But it's not really so far from what we have now. Those of you who have gotten a job in the last 10 years know that you had to bring in two of three mixture of documents in order to be employed to assure your employer that you were legal to work. It's time that we just do it right. Bite number three. Current law-abiding undocumented residents and their citizen children. Okay, so we've solved two parts of the problem now, the two easy parts. We've rationalized legal immigration so that it serves the goals of our nation while protecting our culture. And we have all but eliminated illegal immigration by making it impossible for illegal immigrants to work. Now, the really hard part. What to do about the 12 or 13 or maybe more, everyone agrees that it's 12 to 13, but nobody really knows, million people who are here illegally. No small problem, all our fault, caused by the fact that we didn't solve problems number one and two in a timely way. So 12 to 13 million people, that's the combined population of New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. Imagine all of us gone. Nothing left but cows and chili plants withering in the sun. <laughs> Last year, the INS worked its little heart out and deported a record 300,000 undocumented aliens from this country. At that rate, we're talking about 35 years and as much money as currently goes into the entire Health and Human Service uh, annual budget in this nation. And such a move would have a dire effect on our economy and leave employers without workers and children without parents. Which reminds me, it is time to amend the Constitution to end the birthright provision. In most of the nations of this world, you're only a citizen of that nation if at least one parent is a citizen. We should do the same. It's not good for children to be citizens of a nation their parents don't have a right to reside in. And it significantly limits a nation's ability to humanely control illegal immigration. Polls show that most Americans believe that undocumented workers who have obeyed the law and been employed for many years should be allowed to become citizens of this nation. There's a vocal minority which just wants undocumented uh, workers to go away. No doubt many of you heard on NPR last night a heartbreaking story about a star Harvard student that some people think should be deported because his mother brought him here illegally at the age of four. Anyway, that vocal minority that just thinks undocumented workers can go away is ignorant but insistent. They will have to be careful political calculus created to accomplish this with pros and cons and oxes gored for everyone. It will take a long time and it's time to start. Next Sunday is the 4th of July, a day we celebrate in gratitude for this, the land of the free. Last year on the 4th of July, 6,000 people took the oath of American citizenship, including 1,000 in Disney World, guests of the Disney Corporation, and 237 in Iraq, soldiers born in more than 50 nations serving in our military who were encouraged to apply for citizenship. That makes me so proud. That brings tears to my eyes and catch to my voice. That's who our nation most deeply is. This is a nation 
which took the humble and the poor and the yearning to breathe free, who were actually the enterprising, the energetic, the hopeful, and the entrepreneuring of the world's poor and welcomed it to its lamp-lit shores. We still do. And if we are wise and if we are careful, we will always be able to continue. It's just who we are. So let's end the chaos and enjoy once again being American.